All righty. Thank you guys for joining us for this afternoon's session. So uh, we will be talking about navigating community development in agritourism. Um, so again, we will not be uh, reading speaker bios. You can find those in the Hover app. Uh, so the first session will talk about factors contributing to community conflicts in agritourism and how to avoid these issues. So thank you and welcome. Thank you and hello everyone, those who have stuck it out to this afternoon. I'm Jada Lindblom and, oh, slide is, uh, hold on everyone. No, it's the down. Did you do that or did I do that? Okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, I'm Jada. I was hoping to present this with my colleague Penelope Whitman, but she has since left for another position. But I did want to at least give her some credit in developing this um, this presentation today. So this is a topic that's probably familiar to many of you in the room. The fact that sometimes agritourism does lead to community conflicts or neighbor conflicts and that type of thing. We continually were hearing stories about this across the state of New Hampshire and got curious about what's really going on on the ground creating these sorts of conflicts. So to dig into this topic some more, we started talking with more and more operators of businesses, but also really sought out town planners. And I ended up having in-depth conversations with planners, I think six different planners across the state. And this helped to inform a series of programs that we offered. We had a webinar on uh, a similar topic and then also presented along with Gail, who's sitting right here, <laughs> at the New Hampshire Farm Forest and Garden Expo. And these were interesting experiences because what we found is that we started um, seeing participation from people on different sides of the same issue. Like certain cases, we were uh, having people show up at these events who were the operators or who were the angry neighbors or who were the planning board members that didn't know what to make of all of this. So these sort of stories started to unfold as we went along. So part of why these issues are happening is because agritourism is really growing, both in New Hampshire and um, abroad as well. And I'm going to whip through some of these slides because I realize I have way too much, but I'm happy to forward these slides to any of you afterwards if you're interested. Um, there's also been some cultural trends at play that have been adding to some of these conflicts, such as uh, barn weddings, very popular as uh, many of us have observed. And, and weddings tend to be a contentious thing. And this has come up in a lot of news headlines from across the country. Um, those are just some examples of what uh, some issues have looked like. Generally, these community concerns um, fall into some of these categories here, visual disturbance, noise pollution, traffic concerns on rural roads and those road maintenance issues. Big issue around here in Vermont during mud season, certainly and um, change rural character, which is an interesting one because I think we think of farms as being rural character, but when you start to change the nature of business or start to invite a lot more people to a certain area, that could be a factor as well. Uh, along with, you know, when you have more people coming in, there might be concerns having to do with crime or just that, that fear of the unknown, of not knowing who's in your neighborhood anymore. Uh, loss of serenity and solitude, certainly um, an issue in some more remote areas, along with environmental impacts and resource demands. And a big one at the town level is concerned considering whether, you know, if they start allowing certain things on certain properties, are they going to have to start allowing those things everywhere? Are there dangerous precedences being set potentially? Um, and also some neighbors worry about what um, having something like an agritourism business that might also become an event center, what that's going to mean for their property value. So um, you may all be familiar with this research already from our friends at UVM, along with some nationwide partners that um, asked agritourism operators about what they consider to be challenging. I pulled out a few um, different factors here that pertain to today's topic, and I wanted to highlight, literally, uh, opposition from town or neighbors. A relatively small percentage compared to some of these other issues, but I think if you really think about the fact that a quarter of operators are reporting this type of issue. That's substantial and something to pay a little bit more attention to, in my opinion. <laughs> so I don't want to get too much into the details, but 
Um, it has come up in several sessions that definitions of agritourism matter, right? It makes a difference with, um, you know, zoning and liability coverage and taxation and all different things. In New Hampshire, we have a sort of interesting um, law. Basically, agritourism falls under marketing and it is considered an accessory use to the primary farm operation. Also, it's stated that um, agritourism cannot adver adversely impact neighboring property. But at the same time, um, lawmakers do really recognize that agritourism is a vital way to celebrate the state's rural heritage and create economic opportunity, and thus shall not be un unreasonably limited by use of municipal planning or zoning powers. So there's sort of some push or pull factors when it comes to the state uh, wording and guidelines there. Um, at the local level, this is an example from New Hampshire as well, uh, different um, types of land uses for the rural residential zone mean different permitting requirements. So a farm may be able to have stables and livestock as a matter of uh, permit by matter of right, but um, hospitality related uses like a bed and breakfast would require a special use permit. So I wanted to you know, talk about some of these issues some more with town planners and pick their brains and really try to compile some of the key themes we were hearing across different communities. And they had a lot of tips to share. You know, they wanna make their jobs easier too by making it easier for operators to um, you know, proceed with their plans in a way that's going to benefit everybody. So one of their tips was to really you know, think about first impressions uh, if you're showing up at a meeting, such as a planning board or select board meeting or something of that nature, you know, think about how you're presenting yourself. There's a common tendency to either um, go into a meeting sort of with your battle axe drawn and, you know, ready to like have some sort of conflict. Or another tendency that they uh, they were telling me about is to sort of play it too cool and think that you're gonna you know slip by pulling a fast one and nobody's gonna notice what you're trying to do. So you know don't assume that the planning board um, doesn't pick up on these things. You know they're your peers, they're your community members, and they've likely seen a lot of different things in their in this community as well. Um, the other uh, pet peeve, I would say, of many planners is this idea that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And this has gotten a lot of um, operators into trouble because it is really hard to build back trust if you feel that you have been lied to. And that, that came up in some different cases in New Hampshire where neighbors said, yeah, we wanted to listen to what they had to say, but they clearly misled us in the beginning and now we don't have any trust going forward. So that's a really big one there. The other thing, pretty uh, straightforward coming from planners, they want you to plan ahead. So that means reading the fine print, doing your homework ahead of time, but also not being afraid to ask for help. That is not a weakness necessarily. It shows that you're really doing your due diligence. Um, also important to think about, it's a matter of math really, the more public meetings you have, let's say you have to go to a planning board, uh, the more public meetings you have, the more likely you are to hear from people that are gonna cause issues for you. So if you can be really prepared from the beginning, <laughs> you have a better chance of moving through more smoothly and not having to respond to the same questions again and again when new people show up. Uh, also important to consider what conversations are on the record and what ones may be off the record or informal. And that has gotten uh, subcommittee members into trouble at times as well. So another thing, and this may seem like sort of first grade guidance, but <laughs> show respect and make space to communicate respectfully, show deference to those that may not be behind you and what you're trying to accomplish in your business plan. So if you're planning an agritourism expansion or if you're thinking of um, dabbling in the events world some, um, you know, people are gonna wanna know about that. And a really important thing, especially in small towns is this idea about you know, whether or not you wanna show all of your cards. Because you might have reasons to, you know, maybe your business plan is a little bit proprietary, you're trying to be mindful of the competition that might be out there, but people will fill in the blanks with some potentially wild ideas that are way more outrageous than what you actually hope to accomplish. So 
be mindful of that going forward and consider when transparency may actually be on your side. Also really important to consider the big picture of what you're trying to accomplish in terms of your community. So how does your business plan um, celebrate and reflect local heritage and traditions? And how is it going to create economic opportunity beyond just maybe what you know, what you and your family may benefit? Uh, will there be leisure opportunities and recreation opportunities for community members as well? Will you be helping to protect more farmland into, into conservation? And if your town has a master plan or um, a comprehensive economic development strategy for the re region, think about whether your plans tie into those bigger plans because that will help you make your case as well. It's important to pay a little special attention to events because this tends to be a topic where um, community members' um, eyebrows start to <laughs> raise and they wonder what's going to happen to their neighborhood and that sort of thing. Uh, one thing we heard from planners, but also operators as well, is really think about whether the type of events you're going to be offering are the right fit for your property. Um, just because it works somewhere else doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be right for you and your location and your topography of your land and all of these different considerations. Uh, also think about whether it's something consumers are really going to want in a way that's um, going to help you make a compelling case and uh, whether others will see the value in that also. Really important to think about this matter of expectation versus reality, especially when hosting weddings on farms. Um, it's easy to envision a sort of pastoral scene, but really, you know, farms are working environments. There's mud, there's dirt, there's dangerous equipment lying around. So um, it really is uh, essential to, you know, not idealize what the final product might end up being, because that can get you in trouble. And bad Google reviews mean that you might have, you know, bad rapport with community members as well. They may not think as well of you if you're not generating the outcomes that you hope to. So some areas that you might be able to mitigate some of the um, complaints from those around you, certainly considering visual disturbance and noise disturbance as well. And the old saying that good fences make good neighbors um, can be a really valuable one to remember and also good landscaping but not forgetting that seasonal changes, especially in places like this with lots of deciduous trees can make a really big difference. So, so thinking about where you're placing things, um, you know, convenience of access may not be the same as what's going to look best. And that can be a sort of balancing act sometimes. Uh, also certainly there's considerations um, like legal considerations um, such as setbacks, buffer zones, if you're near a wetland or a water body that need to be taken into consideration. Parking and traffic are big areas of concern amongst many neighbors and community members. Um, and uh, especially in rural areas where you may have a road with twists and turns where the locals are driving fast and they may not be expecting to see, you know, backup where people are trying to get into an event area. So thinking about the flows of that and how seasons and, and timing might change those flows, is a very important thing. So, um, especially in terms of events, it's great to keep in mind that it's not all or nothing. There's some really meaningful sort of compromises or adjustments that can be made to uh, make things flow a, a little bit better. Um, you know, the number of people you're going to welcome onto your property. Weddings are another easy example for this, but, um, you know, you might want to get involved with hosting weddings on your farm, but you could do that in terms of just offering ceremonies and not full receptions. Um, and there's also, you know, ways to get around parking challenges, like by having shuttles deliver visitors and that sort of thing. So also um, a really valuable thing, and I used to manage an event center myself, if you have a preferred list of vendors that you work with, caterers, DJs who know your property and know this sort of context from which you're coming from things, they might understand better that you might kind of be on thin ice. You really can't um, you know, risk things like having an event where the sound level gets too loud or where you know, things just kind of start to fall apart. If they're on your team, they know your venue, they can help ensure that the event goes smoothly. Another thing that we hear a lot from operators 
um, but also, you know, just broadly from the tourism destination development angle is make your business a part of this bigger conversation about regional agriculture. And, um, you know, think about how there's power in numbers and how you can really, um, you know, work together to communicate the value of your businesses. Um, I brought with me and then I realized I left it in my bag, but <laughs> an example that I found in uh, Vancouver Island in British Columbia of a wine bag that lists all of the different wineries in the area. And then on the map has, shows all those wineries on a regional map and such a great way to just communicate that you're part of something bigger to consumers. Um, sort of echoing some of the comments we heard from planners, operators, uh, often reflected, you know, don't try to be something that you aren't. Really think about what's best for what you're trying to do um, in your land and the sort of quirks that exist on your property. Uh, and a big part of that is managing visitors and customers' expectations from the beginning so that you're not over-promising or delivering something different. Also know that visitors tend to be uh, curious. They want to explore. You know, this I've heard from a lot of farm operators that it's hard to sometimes keep families off of tractors and people want to you know, walk across the creek and see what's on the other side. And if you are having a butter issues, that of course could be an issue. So again, the communication piece comes into play. Signage can make a big difference as well as again, fences and hedges and that sort of thing. So I'm running out of time, but um, again, safety and diligence, if you can play uh, to really communicate to your town planning board, to the select board, and to your neighbors that you care about safety and diligence, it's going to impact how they think about you and your level of preparation. So I think I'm just about out of time, sort of some key takeaways that we've touched on here. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you from what you've encountered in your own towns and in your own businesses and continue to share ideas going forward. So here's my contact information and thank you very much. I think it's still working, testing? No? Oh. Oh, couldn't hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, in the state of New Hampshire? You yes. Say, the way. You say from the very beginning of one of them, I suggest to see agriculture as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. not only the place where you put it, to produce, to sell, to buy. It's a part of a complex ecosystem where the nature interacts with the people mm -hmm. and maybe even destroy the environment and buy it and buy it and buy it and produce it and produce it to destroy the environment. So you can take both sides to be to be seen from the people point of view, but also from natural point of view. Absolutely. That's all. Yeah, I really like that point. that envisioning of it. And and just to clarify the the marketing marketplace example, that's from the state of New Hampshire, how they use their legal language. Right. It's an actor in yeah. the landscape. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>
My good. They're working on we're, it. We're teachers, so we don't we don't need it unless you want us to use it for <laughs> online. So yeah. So I mean, okay. you guys yeah. go ahead and start. And we'll oh, I'll work on this. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome again. I guess we're on our third day, fourth day. I don't know. Conferences tend to all be one another, and all I can think about most of the time is I'm playing. So, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Chris Clemens. I'm an associate professor of science education at Auburn University, War Eagle. If you're familiar with Auburn. Um, my counterpart today is Dr. Matt Ulmer. Matt is an extension specialist with ACES, correct? Uh, in Alabama, Matt and I spend a lot of time working together, collaborating on numerous projects, including uh, the work with my former graduate student, my doctoral student, Dr. Mary Casey, who unfortunately, or fortunately, fortunately for her students, she can't be here today. Unfortunately for us, she can't be here because she's much nicer and easier to look at than we are. So uh, we do want to walk through uh, the outcomes of Hello? her Hello? Uh, dissertation. And this is only a, a small component of it. Check but one, two. What is Check one, two. Is agritourism in Alabama Thank you. suffers from a number of issues and none of them being a lack of agriculture. What I mean by that is this is a literacy problem. The majority of producers who function and run a small component of their business, if you will, in agritourism, don't define it that way. So working with a population, eventually a sample in their frame, a lot of this had to be constructed in a way that the word agritourism was not only instructional at one point, but also informative and defined. So Dr. Casey, in a lot of ways, really began to define agritourism as you will define it uh, in Alabama. So if you're unfamiliar with Alabama, Alabama is a very, very long and wide state. It is as diverse in its population as it is in agriculture. In North Alabama, you'll find traditional uh, farming practices of corn, soybeans, a little bit of wheat. As you move through central Alabama, and then eventually South Alabama, you move more into pulp production, uh, small wineries, vegetable production, cotton production, and about 90% of the peanuts grown in the United States are grown in a 500 mile radius of a very large, medium sized town in Alabama. So, further from there, you have the Gulf, which of course speaks for itself with uh, fish, shellfish production, uh, which is very popular. Think of Gulf Shores, right? Orange Beach. So, looking at this, Breaking this down into a particular set of categories that we felt would adequately identify and help us frame the study, we were interested in what uh, Chase defined as the five categories, direct sales, education, entertainment, hospitality, and outdoor recreation. I think one of the overarching themes of this conference has been that not, none of these are more important than the other, right? They are interwoven, they are a confluence of things. Uh, all of them have to work succinctly together uh, for a successful program. So a couple of benefits uh, when we talk about uh, agritourism and kind of a small, very small lit review for the purposes of our discussion today. There's no reason to go into the overly in-depth lit review, which is about eight pages. But we can see here a number of these do fall in line with the five categories. One interesting area that um, Meredith, or sorry, Dr. Casey, uh, and, and Dr. Ulmer and I found really interesting was again this idea of community relationship, which you spoke very heavily about. Um, not just tenants of the land and working with the neighbor, but getting people in Alabama to understand that we have agritourism opportunities right next to them, whether it's pumpkins or peanuts or cotton or craft ships, or so on and so forth. It was just never really thought of hey, this place down the road is agritourism. But I go there every day. I don't think about it. So when we look at uh, Alabama revenue as it relates to uh, some of the longevity study starting in 2002, we see a peak here in 2012 with a substantial dip. I wouldn't say statistically significant because there's no statistics associated with this, right? Often termed not used correctly. So when we look at what is causing this decline, there are a number of factors so that we can interoper interoperate from this, right? We can make some, we can say some assumptions, we can make some inferences, and we can make some facts. Specifically speaking, the fact weather would have played a very large role between 2012 and 2017. We do live in the middle of Hurricane Alley occasionally, uh, even though we're, the whole state of Alabama uh, experiences hurricanes and disasters differently. The Gulf, obviously, they have point of impact. 
through South, Central, and North Alabama, it diminishes with heavy rains and winds are still an issue. So I, how do we identify the problem? And I think what's most important here is to look at the middle bullets, uh, the fluctuation of the industry. The three components that we felt from our prior prior research that we felt really helped or hindered agritourism was an unclear definition. As a producer, are you clearly not you, but are they clearly defining what agritourism is? Do they operate under those nuances? Or is this a production farm? And I think we've heard this over and over this week, the farms are working spaces. Is this a production farm that just has a small retail uh, out on the road or uh, in, the, in, the, in the machine shed. So really setting identification or definition was, was important. A lack of skills, typically the pre or physical myth, the lack of skills pertain a lot to uh, advertising and awareness and marketing towards, uh, I think on your slides, I'm still doing a set of right? Um, the uniqueness of the area that you're in. Alabama is so very not only destructive as well as like production that each sector of Alabama honors something around cotton, shellfish production, and all these What's that? Peaches. Peaches and be peaches and beaches, right? I mean, that's a big thing. <laughs> uh, we have all of that, depending on where you take it. takes you about six and a half to seven hours to go from one end to the other. So if you've ever driven it, came into you, right? Oh, wow. And then, of course, burnout. And this leads us into how we framed the theoretical approach to this study. Oftentimes in our social science research, we use philosophical theoretical frameworks. In this case, we use um, Atkinson's expectancy value theory overlaid with expectancy value cost theory. The interplay between these two, especially in a commerce driven field, are very tightly wound. And what we're talking about here is we look through the lens, if you will, of expectancy value theory that says, Am I going to get the reward out of whatever it is I'm working towards? Is the benefit of the amount of labor, the amount of effort, the amount of time that I have to put in this going to give me results in my own interpretation of what um, immediacy may be? Am I aware of this a year out, 10 years out, five years out? Followed by expectancy value cost, which is very similar to very value theory. Basically, it boils down is the amount of money I'm going to put into something worth the time and effort. Is this my return on investment going to be on the cost of the stuff? So we frame it within this to really filter our results through. What we're trying to say is that both of these theories are highly applicable to what we're studying now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we actually applied this. So from the construct from the extension side of the house, we wanted to know more about the agritourism operators of the age of so in order to do that, we need to know what their characteristics were. Were they UPEX? Were they come on site and come have an entertainment day where you're getting hay rides, you're getting some sort of Halloween themed, you know, scary adventure, so on and so forth. So we want to get a sense of who they were because when you start to talk to the Alabama Department of Agriculture and Industries, in a lot of places this may be similar, they have the data, they know who the farms are, but they can't give you a ton because if only three operators in one community or one county report in the data, they can't give you specific data because you might be able to call out, hey, that farm's really big, these are their numbers relative to the others. So they have to be very protective of that data. So we had to figure out as best we could what the characteristics of Alabama agricultural operators look like. The second, we wanted to understand more clearly what are these activities that are really resource intensive to them because from an extension standpoint, we want to support them. We want to invest in them, we invest in resources and tools that can support them. And we thought, you know, in terms of their time, their financial invest, excuse me, and their labor investment. And then what motivated them to get involved with agriculture? We saw a tremendous shift. Oh. We saw an initial shift in what motivates people because we saw in 2012 there were so many and then they backed down in 2017. What was the motivating factor? What changed? What was the same? What might have changed from a policy standpoint or a cultural standpoint that motivated people to change up their, their way of going about business? And then lastly, you know, what motivating factors were there to continue an agritourism operated operation? So it was very much a quantitative design. We decided to do a survey method because we wanted to get in front of people in a way that was comfortable to them 
And so Dr. Casey worked with me and Alabama Extension structured in a county-based model. So we have 67 county offices, one for each Alabama county, staffed with agricultural and county agents capable of helping us identify these farmers. And so the list that we pulled were about 128 to us. Now we know that there were closer to over 400 agritourism operators, but the ones we had the contact information for ready to call contact, we had 128. So phone and email was used to recruit them. We got 64 by phone, 64 by mail, and it was based on the information that we had for them. So Dr. Casey designed a six part web-based questionnaire. We used Qualtrics to disseminate it. And we used uh, obvious measures of reliability and validity. And we attempted to reach them by five, at minimum five points of contact to make sure that we gave them every opportunity to participate. So 39 ultimately started the, the survey and 23 completed. Uh, used SPSS and can't talk descriptive statistics. Point of clarity that, that Matt and I talk a lot about is when you look at the available population, what we attempted to do was reduce frame error, right? So we knew there were 400, we had 128 we had contact for. In order to uh, meet the assumptions of the study, it was decided that there could be the possibility for these other 380, 78, whatever it might be, uh, that we couldn't get a contact with. Was it really worth dragging something out for another year? So we went with what we had. So just like every uh, research presentation, I am so excited to walk through every single number with you. Please. I hope you're all coming because we are going to get through yeah. okay. no. I, I can't, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm usually sitting there, I can't, I know, right? I, I'm usually sitting in the audience going, okay, what's on my phone and what's happening in the world when I see numbers? So we're going to pull out the really, really fun things. Just as we would expect, looking at age, we tend to see uh, a migration towards older producers, somewhat expected. I really can't tell you why, other than all of us being in agriculture, we kind of know the field. An interesting characteristic that came out of this is related to gender. In this study, we cannot generalize, obviously, because we don't have a, thank you, we have a very small population, but it is almost equally split, which is really, really interesting. Sure. Um, household size, some basic things here. Uh, when the number of people in a house, it's, this is all characteristic data that had the, the sample been larger, or the response rate, I'm sorry, been larger, uh, inferential analyses would have played a much larger role, okay, beyond just descriptive. Uh, education level, you can see here bachelor's degree uh, and a little bit of uh, post bachelor's degree were available uh, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, 65%. Uh, the size of farms, the size of the operation, uh, the average would have been, or the mean, I guess, somewhere around have been 50 to 139 acres. So, uh, you know, from what we kind of understand about agritourism, this seems to be well within that range, right? If that's the primary side of it. Uh, when we're dealing with 1,000 to 2,000 or over the 2,000 acres, we can assume we're dealing with very large scale production, right? Whatever X crop that might be. Uh, length of farm ownership. Interesting that we see uh, ownership in the first six to 15 years, which opens up a lot of questions. Were these purchased? Were they inherited? How are they, they being the participants, identifying uh, uh, ownership? Uh, length of time they've offered the activities. This would correlate very, or, or uh, uh, line up very carefully or very easily with the slide I showed you of the money being brought in over the last 12 years. You can see that six to 10 years uh, and 11 to 15 are followed only by how new a lot of this is in Alabama with one to five years, roughly 30% of participants uh, that responded, or, or one third really, um, are, are very young in this field. Uh, percentage of income, obviously it's a beginning industry. This is a, a kind of a, a, an ancillary and auxiliary uh, time to generate money. A lot of the participants indicated that this was uh, to offset cost expenditures in the off season, right? So this was a 25% bump in revenue that they could have when production uh, was not being conducted or sales. Uh, amount of land dedicated to agritourism, again, this, this does line up very well with the size of the farm, right? We would, we would extrapolate from this, the smaller the farm, that 100 to 100, what it was, 30 to 150 acres uh, would, would correlate very quickly to here. I'm trying to move through this quickly. Um, summer and, and spring are obviously uh, uh, big times for this. Peach harvest is done usually around Memorial Day. Um, 
So interpreting data, just right, real quick, I'm trying to get through as quick as I can. Uh, this was a Likert scale, a one to five uh, interval measurement range is really what it was. So a couple things where we're seeing uh, time and how where the, the, the majority of, of the time is being taken. It falls under other followed by marketing. Money, uh, again, marketing, marketing <laughs> under personal labor. Um, and then what was their motivation to start? Uh, benefit from tax incentives. And that's, yeah, there we go. And then again, why do they continue? I'm sure it's from the tax offsets or how they shelter that. And then Matt will wrap up with the implications. That was a very quick walkthrough of a lot of numbers, so. So we'll skip this, but we'll jump to the end. Uh, the Agritour's op operators really spent the most time on general farm upkeep, recruiting and training staff and managing their risk. And we see that agritourism for these farmers especially provide both fan financial and social value to those farmers. And that is the main reason why they continue to participate in agritourism. So with that, we will try to answer maybe a question given the time remaining. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Dean. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm still here. So uh, could you go back to slides? Just, no, no, another one. Another one. Motivation, not the other one, the subject, objective number three. Motivation to start agriculture. Are you content with the figure? Because it was very, very fast moved. Yeah. And I don't understand if these figures are very relevant if the people like to start an agriculture business. From your point of view, it's just a question. These fingers, figures say you, show you it is possible to start an agribusiness? Yeah, I, I think, what, and if I understand what you're saying, I'm hearing you correctly. The, the implication of this and what you're seeing here, yes, there could just be a roadmap, right? Could you follow this to start? Yes, you could, but there is an inherent danger in saying this would work forever, right? The, the response rate was so low that the 2033 that responded, this is on average what works for them. I would not feel comfortable having Dr. Casey publish this out as a roadmap, right? Mm. Just because the frame is so small, like the, the population or sample is so small, the sample is so small. Now, if we multiply this by 10, right? And we had 230 of our uh, active agritourism growers in the state, I would feel then say, listen, this is a little more accurate picture. Right now, this is a kaleidoscope is how I see it, right? I know the picture's there, but I'm trying to get it into focus. And inherently, we run into the problem with statistical analysis and statistical reporting is we take these numbers as true. And this is the starting point for future research to poke at this. So you start to meet with different groups. We would have to take this data and say, with focus groups, we might invite more farmers or others that are interested in agritourism. As an input for your research, for your decision-making process in the consultancy for giving advice to the people Absolutely. It gives us a little bit of something to play with to get into the next steps. And then we'll, yeah, we it's, would, we will, we'll take it like Chris said as a big assumption, but we would walk in with it armed with this information to start to validate anecdotally and then build from there to expand. Our okay. Business. And compared with objective number four, the next one, the figures, the figures are relevant by comparing them because uh, how many we like to start, how many like to continue. It's, it, it's the, a good. And the only way to adequately capture that would be to identify. You could do this in a couple of ways. You could do it from a no way. I would argue to say, let's get first year producers or first year owners, talk to them on the way in. What was your motivation for starting? Talk to them on the way out. They the first year. Are you continuing? If so, then why? That would lead a much more in depth focused analysis of this slide had we put a time frame. Instead, with an initial study trying to get people to understand, hey, we're out here, we're trying to get you. It's one moment, yes, to say. Yes. I would follow this up with a, a, a much more maybe quasi experimental and say, hey, in the first year, tell me why you stayed, why you left, and move on. Then go into a qualitative or qualitative analysis and go and say, why did you leave, why did you stay? To me, that's a much more in depth way to present this than saying, okay, here's what we have with this very small so It's about the decision to be, to be taken concerning the sustainability of agribusiness. 
Yes. Yeah. And I, I'll be honest, I think that answer would change every year. I mean, those of us in agriculture know. Okay. That thank you. You're right. to have them follow up. And then the other research question from here is, is that tax benefit? It's the same in response to that. What are those incentives and why are they so lucrative to keep above and beyond everything else on this list? So with that, we'll hand it back to you, Madam Howard. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay, and right into our next presentation, we got to keep things moving very smoothly so we can all make the plenary session at 4 p.m. promptly. So next speaker, cooperation in rural tourism, opportunities and challenges for tourism and agriculture. There we go. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, just get prepared. We, we are really just in time because I'm just uh, checking online if my colleague are already there. So uh, my colleague is there. Um, this, and I'm not sure if uh, someone of you already uh, uh, joined my Prima uh, sessions. Uh, someone of you joined? Yeah? OK. <laughs> so a few, because this is the third part of my presentation. Uh, just uh, in the for, for the one who, who didn't join the, the first uh, two, so it was about the diversification and the role of women, uh, which gets supported by agriculture. The second one was then the valorization of landscapes, because it's quite important who is the owner of the land, so who who owns the land and who cultivates the land and what tourism, for example, is using uh, is might be owned by a farmer or might have to be cultivated by a farmer. And this is what's called, is quite important because uh, this is also the basis of the conflicts we have. Uh, so we always start uh, uh, our research with, uh, uh, with a conflict uh, focus group because it's very important that to bring tourist members and agriculture members together and let them discuss uh, first what is their viewpoints. And you have always the same thing, or mostly the same thing, tourism destro destroying our, our culture uh, and uh, over tourism uh, is, is a, a big of a challenge. And from the farmer side, uh, they don't get the acceptance what they do on cultivating landscapes. Yeah, and you have to dis let them discuss. And I, I have to say, always like to fight at the beginning because it's it's a need to to go the next step. Yeah, so we always say uh, uh, communication is the key. But first, we have to go in a bit of a discussion, a confrontive discussion. Then uh, uh, we, we we can start uh, with the next step. Uh, and therefore, um, also what is clear then also is that tourism is an important factor. And uh, what, what I have seen here in the last two days, and honestly, when I, when I did running here around, yeah, I saw infrastructure done because of tourism. Yeah? And this we have to say. So uh, especially in America, I have to say what, what I saw, a lack of infrastructure. But in the moment I came in an area where there is tourism, infrastructure is quite okay. Yeah? And uh, this is also something, a basis which is quite important for us uh, because uh, tourism at the moment gets a lot of bash uh, and uh, uh, always questionized about over tourism, then came COVID and thank God people recommended that might, uh, tourism might be quite important. Uh, so uh, we, 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 we need this linkage between each other uh, uh, to, 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 to go then the next step. And this was the background of our study. So tourism as a focus of economic development uh, planning, economic diversification through tourism, to be successful in tourism management and interdisciplinary network is needed between the sectors. So between agriculture and tourism is very important. Uh, and what we heard before, we have a communication gap uh, because both sectors don't speak so much to each other. And if they speak, uh, it is quite uh, controversial. So uh, 
now I'm the quantitative researcher. Now I have, and this is the good thing because we want to publish in a, in a high level paper. So we also need a quality, uh, a, sorry, I'm the qualitative and my colleague is the quantitative. So uh, Markus, uh, Marco Haidt is uh, also online there. And I want now to hand over, uh, we do it by video, but he's then ready also to answer your question. Uh, and uh, I want to hand over to him to explain our quantitative part in our mixed uh, uh, method uh, research. Right. According to the theory of learning organizations, the literature states that firms and companies need to collaborate for a variety of reasons. Variables like expertise, trust and commitment, experience and some kind of a common understanding of sustainability play an important role in collaborations. Completing this, also trust and communication are considered essential, an essential component of collaborations in the literature. Collaboration leads to the exchange of information and knowledge, synergies, higher economic benefits, income, employment opportunities, and higher quality of services offered within the destination. Furthermore, advantages arise when there are strategic advantages, costs are minimized, and all parties involved strive for a better reputation uh, so that everyone recognizes the need and importance of cooperation. So on the next slide, you can see a hypothesis a model, a theoretical background that has been taken from existing literature, particularly from work done by Bellini et al. And we put all these findings and all these and and yeah, all the findings from the literature into this specific context of an agriculture touristical collaboration. And as we can see here, several factors play an important role in the functioning and beneficial and a good cooperation between the stakeholders of a region and tourism. Those interrelationships you can see in the presented model. Experience in collaboration, trust and commitment, as well as collaborative know-how, and as mentioned, the common understanding of sustainability play an important role for a good collaboration which offers benefits for all the stakeholders and here we have our target value and these all these other uh, um, factors are influencing variables all right and so we reach the aim of the study and the gap we aim to identify and clarify factors of a successful collaboration especially in the rural areas Hence, our research question is, which factors are crucial for cooperation in rural tourism? All right, and to, to foster our research question and to foster our research goal, um, we first started with a systematic literature uh, research to better understand the state of art and to better gain uh, a good insight into the theoretical background. All right, and then we did a quantitative research by means of online service in which 244 members of the association Urlaub and Bauernhof, that means holiday on the farm, in the Austrian regions Vorarlberg, Tyrol and Salzburg. Um, and there we did an online survey. All right. With the help of a linear regression analysis, the data was evaluated. And let's move on to the results. The core result showed that the two sectors, tourism and ag agriculture, demonstrably complement each other in their cooperation, which creates a corresponding added value for all. And that farms make a significant contribution to the preservation of the regional landscape used uh, for tourism. So we can see here, once again, the theoretical model 
adapted from Bellini et al. 2019. And as we can see here, the red arrows indicate significant correlations and influences. And we can see here all the relationships are significant. That means that all factors influence the benefits of collaboration. So we have here collaborative experience has a direct influence uh, to the benefits uh, of collaboration. Also, the common understanding and the common importance of sustainability has uh, a direct relationship or a direct influence to the benefits of collaboration. And we also have collaborative know-how and trust and commitment, which um, here shows an, a mediator relationship between collaborative experience and benefits of collaboration. So thank you, Marco, for, uh, for explaining us the, at, at least a bit complex model, but this is quite important because this, this model gives us uh, a next step level. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, we, uh, uh, we have clearly implica implication and we already, by the recommendation, already went a step further. So it's about on communication. Um, it's about uh, if, we, if we want to support this model and want to support by this collaboration between agriculture and tourism, it's about mainly what you said before, it's on communication. Uh, to strengthen trust and commitment, we have to bring them together. If they don't talk, they, they have their ideas of the opposite. Yeah? And uh, so we, we, we really have to lead them uh, uh, into discussion where we speak about spillover effects, uh, where we speak about knowledge, where we speak about experience, positive and negative experiences, so they can do, uh, go the next step. Uh, and by this also, they get, uh, they, they both sectors get a good understanding of this uh, shared value they have. Uh, so we have therefore to organize regular meetings, uh, network events and information sessions. Uh, so we always talk about customers, we always talk about uh, tourists. We, we have to bring also the sector, the provider together. Uh, and, uh, and really bring them not only in conferences, but in each of the destination, bring them together and let them talk uh, to, the, to get, uh, also to get to know each other. It's, it's, it's amazing when you do a focus group in a small valley where you think they know what they are doing uh, and they are neighborhood and the farmers know what the tourists are doing and tourists know what the farmers are doing. No way, no. Uh, the reality is, they believe they think what they are doing and they are totally surprised then that, for example, the hotel, when it becomes to uh, the bad weather program, uh, they just have to go to the farms and can send the tourists to their farm. And this is a, a huge experience and a wonderful thing. And a, a hotels welcome this. Yeah. So this was just a mind breaking through by these regular meetings. And also, and this is where we are at the moment, digitalization. So thank to COVID, I, I, I'm maybe one of the person, uh, and I have to say, uh, people from Italy, we saw the trucks uh, on dead bodies, uh, and I saw this last time Sierra Leone. It was really a sad, uh, a sad moment. From the economic side, this this stop, uh, and this this breakthrough by people had to reconsider the businesses. Uh, I think it's a, a really push in digitalization and a really push in new business models. Yeah, so, so people have found ways to do it in a distant way, to do it digital. And we just say, please don't stop it, what you have done. Let's continue on it. And what we are doing, we use it as a mediator effect. Now the model comes uh, to, uh, to realize by digitalization because we use this as a, moder uh, as a moder uh, moderator effect, because we use the apps and the technology and the access and the, uh, the marketing from the tourism side. And we use an app, which uh, is offered by uh, Farm on Holidays, 
that the farmers can put their numbers of how many room they have, how much uh, events they do, and they put it in and they say, okay, we can do a, a, a farm tour tomorrow, uh, play it in, it automatically plays out and it goes directly to the hotel on the screen and the tourist can see, okay, tomorrow we can book via the app of the tourist organization, we can uh, book the, uh, this, this event. And the farmer 10 minutes later gets uh, the event is booked. And this is an enormous push effect. Uh, and nobody questions this anymore. We just install it, we just try it. Uh, we, we, we are working on this. And after we have done this, we will uh, we just do a pilot. We do a pilot uh, in, in our region and then we roll it out on, on the Austrian side. And also we will roll it out also on the international side because what I have learned in these three days, we have the same challenges globally. Uh, on communication, on uh, the idea of agriculture, the, uh, does it has benefits, on the valorization, on price effects, on why we don't work together. <laughs> yeah, And we just use digitalization as a tool. And we have so many apps, and I'm 100% sure I haven't found out this uh, so far, and I stay one month more here, here in the US, but I'm 100% sure we have already existing systems and we don't have to invent uh, things new. We just have to combine it. And this is smart data management. Uh, 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 this, this combining the data system, combining the data, uh, um, the data we have, playing out and use what we have. And by this, do then the collaboration. Uh, if you contradict this, I'm happy to discuss this. If you want to add here something in our research and are interested doing more international research, because I think this is essential, and I was so happy this morning to join this network. Uh, 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 when we when we do international uh, uh, studies together, uh, because I think what we have found out can be totally uh, can be just implemented and afterwards in also in other areas. Thank you very much. Also, my colleague is now live. Uh, so if there is any question on the on the model, uh, we are happy to answer it. Yeah, please. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question about the communication and trust and collaboration. And um, I'm a social scientist as well. And I see that in the literature, you know, this is something that is always discussed that we need more of this. But did you guys look at all of that into the nitty gritty of actually how you build those relationships? Because there does seem to be the silo effect that when people are in different sectors, you know, how, how do you get across that? Because it, it seems to be these structural barriers and part of it is language as well. When you're working, you know, farmer is gonna be different than a person and using different language who works in tourism. So have you guys found, are there any interesting initiatives where people are working in partnership to kind of break down these silos and build this trust and social capital? That's so necessary. Marco, may, would you like to answer or should I answer? Um, I think that's that's more a, a qualitative question where you find out the best practices. So I will leave the answer to you, Alexander. <laughs> this is a pity because I really wanted that he get some quantitative answer. But no, 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 <laughs> I'm happy about the, the question. I'm also a psychologist. Uh, and I, 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 I really enjoy these focus groups. I really enjoy this because it's just you, you give, you, you stimulate this discussion and then you let them go and you could even leave the room and you have already done the first step because they get an understanding of each other. And as you said, they get also the exchange in languages yeah? because they have other things of how to book, how to do things. So what, what we have seen in this focus group, they start already after an hour to learn from each other. 
And the, you know, the, the most fantastic thing after each focus group, they stand together, they don't go home, they stand together and still arrange things. Yeah. So honestly, one of the things I would do, I would like to, uh, to do 20, 30 focus groups all over Austria, all over the world, just to stimulate this. So, but we can't do 200, 300, 2000 focus groups. So what we have to do and what we do is uh, um, model rolling. So uh, we will show best cases. Uh, we show example where uh, uh, cooperation between tourism and agriculture worked well. And we know because, uh, I mean, with this new pilot uh, we do, we will be very successful also from the profit side because this is one of the highest touristic, highest developed valleys in Austria and in whole Europe, they know about this valley of Silatal. Uh, so when we, when we are successful there, it will spread out and we will repeat and we will try, we will communicate this, we will write papers, but also, and this is also, I said this morning, um, I'm not coming from the scientific side. So I'm, I'm a junior scientific, but I'm coming from the management side. So when we did research, we always do a report in their mother language of the people we interviewed. And uh, it's a practitioner report. So we hand it over to them. Uh, and uh, so they have something already to read. And then we write the academic paper on this. All right, that seems like just about out of time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marco.